This is the second part of my lecture on cubic splines. Uh, actually, this goes beyond cubic splines. So I, I want to um, tie up a couple loose ends, and I also want to uh, show you how you do this in R. So what I've told you so far is that we're going to have uh, you know a smoothing spline, which is a which 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 comes from a penalized least squares problem, where I control how um, flexible my my function is through this penalty term lambda. Well, there's a, there's a little bit of a problem with this, and that is we don't like to think in terms of lambdas. What's a big lambda? Well, it kind of depends on the scaling of my data and. And, and many things that I, I, I just don't want to think about. So what we really need is a way to um, describe how flexible my function is without, um, uh, you know, th this, this thing that I don't really understand. So I, I'd like to have something that I'm, I'm more accustomed to. And so that thing that I'm really accustomed to is, is something called, you know, the, the model degrees of freedom. So if you think back to all the things we did in the first part of the course where we were counting the degrees of freedom and we had tests, if I got rid of a certain number of degrees of freedom, uh, I kind of understand what a degree of freedom is. It's, it's a parameter in one of my models. So there's a, there's a way to convert the lambdas into what are called equivalent degrees of freedom for a smoother. So I can have a smoother with three degrees of freedom which is a fairly um, inflexible smoother, or I could have a smoother with eight degrees of freedom. And so you hear eight parameters to represent a curve that must, that must have a lot of flexibility and, and you're exactly right. And so the way software usually handles this is not by um, uh, accepting a, 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 you know, a lambda value, although some do, um, they, they often, ask you to specify how many degrees of freedom do you want to use on your uh, on your spline. So there's there's some math here that I don't want to get into. Uh, it relates to some things that we talked about earlier with the with the hat matrix way back in linear regression. Uh, and you can apply this to ridge, you know to, to understand the degrees of freedom associated with ridge regression as well. But um, I don't I don't want to do this and do all that in this video. So um, if you're interested in this I can um, send you send you some references on this instead. So, um, which smoother should you use? the um, The answer to that is um, I, I don't think it matters that much. So, different software have different smoothers built in. So, I used to use SPSS, and they didn't have splines, but that was okay. The smoothers they had. You know, I think they had a kernel smoother. Uh, you know, was gave gave a good fit. So kernels smoothing splines. There's another method we haven't talked about at all, which is um, LOS. LOS is another method you may run into. It's a local regression method. Uh, variation of some of the ideas that we've talked about. Uh, all these are are respectable smoothers. Use whatever your software has. Um, how do you pick the smoothing parameter? So I, I pulled a quote from Hastings Tipsharani's book. And what they basically say in this quote, you can read it yourself, is uh, you, you probably want to use cross-validation, but um, that's not always possible um, because a lot of the methods that we're going to study later on this week uh, are too complicated to really do cross-validation all the time on. And so therefore, what we're going to do is um, often we'll just use our eyes, plot it, and, and if it looks about right, we're, we're, we're happy. All right, so so that's um, that's on picking the, uh, the, the you know the level of, of uh, smoothness. How do you do this in different software packages? Well, in R, there's a couple ways. So the the, the first function that was available for fitting splines was called smooth dot spline, and I already showed you an example of this in the previous video where I use smooth dot spline to superimpose a smoother on top of a scatter plot. Uh, that's what it does, and it's very good at it. So I still use smooth dot spline if I want to just show uh, 
um, you know, a, a relationship. Actually, both of those things that I had, um, let me go back and show it to you. Both of these were, um, were using a smoothing spline. Um, so that was a smoothing spline. Here's a smoothing spline. Here's an example of how you do that. All right. Um, there are other ways. So there, there's a function called the generalized additive model, which will be in my next video. In the generalized additive model, there is a function called S. It's not a function, actually. It's, it's, um, it's something that you can apply in a formula to add a smoother to your, um, your term. Now, there's another set, uh, set of functions. That, that it's called the BS or for, for B-spline. I mean, we talked a little bit about B-splines in my last video. BS can be used with any of the modeling uh, functions that we've already talked about. So you can use BS in GLM, LM, or GAM. You can only use S in, G, in, in the GAM function. Now you're probably wondering, why do I bother telling you about both of these? The, um, the reason is that sometimes one of these will crash, <laughs> and it's not like it's always one. If, if, if it were always one, then I would not tell you about it. So sometimes in order to get a problem to work, you have to go to the other method. So if, if you're using S with GAM and it bombs, then go to use the BS function in GLM or, G, or LM and it will often work. It's also available in SAS. You can get it in ggplot with, um, with the geom dot, uh, underscore smooth function as well. All right, well, let's... Um, go through some examples. If I were to use uh, my wave example, so let's re really finish this off, here's the way I could do it. So in LM, remember, um, I can use this BS, the B-spline function, uh, and, and it's, th I, I think R does a great job of making this easy. So I just say BS at X, and that says, don't give me a linear effect for X, give me a spline. And um, you know, here this is what the function looks like, and it looks pretty good. So when you do a drop one, what you end up with is something that has three degrees of freedom. So that's why I mentioned those degrees of freedom to you. And this is uh, going to give us an actual F test. It also gives us um, AIC statistics that uh, test whether or not I need the nonlinear spline. And so the um, the fact that this is highly significant is one indication that I do need this nonlinearity. So I'm going to go into a little more detail in a second on this. But before I do that, let's uh, let's talk about controlling the degrees of freedom with the DF argument. So another thing I can do is uh, I can add this DF equals however many degrees of freedom I want. And so if I have three degrees of freedom, you'll see I get this red line, which is a little bit stiff. As I increase the degrees of freedom, my lines become more flexible. So I'll make it a little bit bigger. So you see the cyan function with 17 degrees of freedom wiggles a lot. The, the dark blue with 11 wiggles less, but it wiggles probably too much. Whereas the, the green function is really good. The green function is, is great. You can see at the end, it, it's getting it quite right. Whereas the red one is, is it doesn't have enough flexibility to make that final turn green one is making the final turn. Cyan is just out of control. All right, so how would I know that this is good? Well, one way that I could do this is having a big test set. So remember I had a test set with um, 10,000 observations. I'm going to apply the spline estimated from my 30 training cases to that test set of 10,000 cases. And so here we're making that bias variance trade-off chart. And so what you'll see is that my uh, training error just keeps getting better as I add more degrees of freedom, but the test set error goes down for a while and then it starts to increase. Not sure what's happening with 19 degrees of freedom there, but uh, you know the general trend is that it increases. And when I when I look at this, I'd say I need five, maybe seven degrees of freedom at most, but probably five, um, and that's the green function that I'm showing over here. I want to mention one more thing. I added normal errors so that the, um, the true variance was 0 
The test set error is 0 .05, 0 0.0656, which is almost equaling the, uh, the, the, the true error rate. So this is an amazing uh, function that I can, I can approximate this fairly complicated sine wave with only 30 data points and come very close to the true error rate. So that, 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 that's very good. So now I want to talk a little bit more about the test that uh, can be done. So here's um, I, what I've done is I, I decided to make a function, make data from a, a function that's not curved. So this is uh, a linear function. I'm going to take y is equal to 2 times some x plus some errors. So you know if I wanted to graph this, I could. Uh, it looks something like this. That's my function. So y equals 2x. So what, what I'm doing here is I put a spline on top of it. I'm, I'm doing this in kind of an unusual way so that you can understand what this test is all about. So I'm going to fit the model y is equal to some linear effect x plus the b spline around x. Now, if I do an ANOVA on this, Remember what ANOVA does, is it says, let's bring in x alone. So here's x alone. And notice, if I bring in x as a linear effect, it's very highly significant. Then I'm going to bring in the next term. So the next term is I'm going to add an additional 2 degrees of freedom to capture the nonlinearity. So what this f-test is doing is it's saying, do I need those two degrees of freedom? And the answer is no. So my p-value is not significant, so I cannot reject the null hypothesis that those two degrees of freedom are unnecessary. So, so back in uh, week two or three, whenever it was, what I'm really testing is, do I need the second and third degrees of freedom versus the alternative at least one of these, so you can say beta 2 is not 0, and or beta 3 is not 0. So this is, uh, in, in English, no spline. This is spline. We need the spline. And so in this case, my function is linear. This test is saying you don't need those two degrees of freedom. The, the first one is all you need. All right, now let's go look at the test you would probably do in real life. In real life, you would use the GAM function and stick S around it, so S, S at X. And when you, get a, when you do a summary on this, you end up with a couple parts of the output. So you get your null and residual deviances and AIC like you usually do, but then you get a test for the parametric effect. Now, my advice to you is to pay attention to the degrees of freedom. S at X is somewhat of a you know, misnomer. It's not the smoother of X. This is just X. And you know that because there's one degree of freedom associated with it. And so this is very highly significant. And this is saying exactly what this other result told me. Uh, the linear term is necessary. Then we come down and there's an ANOVA for the non-parametric effects. S is going to add an additional three degrees of freedom, and it's saying you don't need it because this is a, um, a linear model. Can't reject the null hypothesis that those three degrees of freedom are necessary. So uh, that's why I, you know, made us, uh, you know, look at these drop one and ANOVA sums of squares earlier. Uh, here's another application of them. They're very useful. All right. Uh, so that's uh, that's it for my lecture on. Um, on using splines in, in R.